Hello, and thanks for joining today's presentation of how should you manage omni-channel content in 2020. My name is Scott Dill with Real Story Group on the, on, on the business development team, and uh, our founder and CEO, Tony Byrne, will be on the line momentarily to take us through the heart of today's presentation. But I did want to kick things off with a couple uh, housekeeping items of note. Uh, I do see some uh, new folks on the line today, so welcome. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. Um, we do have time at the end for questions, so if you do have questions or feedback that you'd like to share, you're welcome to enter those into the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, also, for our subscribers on the line, you will be able to um, uh, access a recording of today's presentation in your subscriber library, and everyone uh, who's in today's session will be uh, getting a copy of the slides uh, later this week. So. Uh, stay tuned from that from our marketing team. As we get started, I do want to uh, just provide a little bit of background about Real Story Group, what we are, and and um, and you know the different markets that we follow. Um, this map here represents the different vendors and different marketplaces that we evaluate within our research. Today, we're going to focus on our newest research area, which we're calling omni-channel content platforms which is represented by the red line here in the subway map. Um, you can certainly uh, uh, download uh, a copy, uh, excuse me, an ex excerpt from this research uh, after today's session, but uh, really we're gonna take you through uh, a little bit more of how you should be managing uh, your omni-channel content platform as we uh, get into not just uh, a new year, but a new decade, um, and it's certainly an exciting one in the omni-channel technology space. To provide a little bit more uh, historical background about Real Story Group. We've been at this for almost 20 years now. And where we differ from traditional analyst firms is that we really don't rank who's the best and who's the worst or uh, believe in any sort of uh, magic or, or ways or anything that, like that, but rather we look at what's going to be the right fit for what it is that you're trying to do. What's the best technology fit? And also, um, you know, if you look at your strategic considerations, what are the vendors that are best aligning with your goals? So um, that's the way that we go into our evaluations. We're uh, known as the toughest critics in the analyst space in this particular area, and that's a reputation that we're quite fond of. So we don't speak at uh, vendor events or uh, write white papers for them in any way. So our focus is on you as a technology user and buyer. So something to keep in the back of your mind uh, as you're going through today's presentation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to kick things over to Tony to talk a little bit more uh, about omnichannel content platform technology. Tony? Thanks, Scott. I'm really excited about this particular topic because, you know, this has been something that we've been talking about for 20 years. I think for a long time we thought of it in the context of content management as sort of multi-channel content management and, um, you know, various systems trying to crack this nut in different ways. Um, I think that the omni-channel sort of revolution that's happening right now is forcing us all to, you know, remember some hard lessons, but also be thinking really differently about what this means uh, in terms of a true omni-channel stack. So I'm going to start out with just a little bit of context here. So, you know, we all have different engagement channels, like you see on the left, and 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 those channels you want to have the right content and message, obviously, which we're talking about today in the red box but to the right person, so you need customer data in the right context, so you need rules and decisions and perhaps personalization at the right time, so you need some operational planning, and then ultimately measure the effective, right? So you need analytics for that. The challenge is, as you see, is that there's a lot of different places on the right where you wanna contextualize and assemble these experiences from you know, point of sale, chat, obviously your website, but potentially ads, so on and so forth, different applications, e-commerce, so on. And so, you know, what often happens is you have these silos that each have their own content data and rules and, and planning and so forth. And what happens is from a customer perspective, um, when you start thinking about this from the customer uh, in, as opposed to from the enterprise out, you often find that they have isolated, disjointed or inconsistent customer experiences as they traverse and relate to you and engage with you across these different channels. And so, I think this is on everyone's agenda for this year, and I would argue for this decade to try to resolve this and develop a more customer-centric sort of engagement strategy and stack, right? 
So at Real Story Group, what we've come up with is a kind of a service model for an integrated customer experience where you still have engagement channels where you're providing that context, but you have these foundational services that are not channel specific, that live underneath those channels. And so you have omni-channel operations, unified customer data, very important journey orchestration and personalization for coherent interaction. And then what we're talking about today, which is omni-channel content, which is a single source of the truth for reusable assets and information. And this allows you to then have story and some experiential consistency across all of these platforms. This is it from a more architectural model, right? It's a reference model for the 2020s, where you see these foundation services underneath different content and engagement management platforms. And here we have probably the newest of all of these and is omni-channel content platform, which is a, again, a, a content object store for base components, right? And so it lives underneath all of these different content and engagement platforms. What's interesting about this, of course, is that you also have information management systems above it. And so the question is, you know, how do these coexist? Our argument is that you have your base reusable components and assets here, and then you have extended components and assets that are channel specific, living up in your content and engagement platform layer. So we sometimes describe this as Pilates for your stack, working on your base rather than your abs. You still have some channel specific services you can see on the left, like contextualization, assembly, delivery, and interaction. But then you have some enterprise wide services as well, core customer data, core content, not all of your content, but your core content, insights, orchestration, personalization, collaboration, and omni-channel availability, right? That's all happening ideally at an enterprise level. To be sure, this is a target or aspirational reference architecture. We don't know of any of our even more advanced subscribers who have this today, but nearly all of Real Story Group's enterprise subscribers are working towards some semblance of this right now. So let's talk about this emerging space of omni-channel content platforms. Nominally, what it does is it provides reusable themes, assets, information to your content and engagement management platforms and your other interaction and delivery environments. So these can be text and copy snippets, offers, longer narratives, images, video, audio documents, micro experiences, where used data becomes really important and, and any number of other things that you may want to be able to distribute in a more centralized way into multiple channels. So let's talk about some services and use case. Well, it starts really with core content support for more component asset management. So that's what we're talking about here is component asset management, like email components, mobile promos, uh, social posts, other kinds of micro content, micro experiences, digital and video assets, audio assets, and more. So it's a screenshot here where within an omni-channel content platform, I'm managing uh, some email promotions, um, and I'm doing that in a, in a dynamic way and then connecting that up to my email service provider, right? So I'm not actually managing the content in my ESP, I'm managing it in my omni-channel content platform, where I may then be reusing some of those core assets and elements across other channels as well. But if we look beyond sort of component asset management, it brings us more to compound asset management, and there's some really important business use cases here as well. Um, we've identified nine of them, and if you're familiar with Real Story Group, this is the core of how we evaluate vendors, is the extent to which they fulfill particular use cases. And usually the typical vendor, when there's a marketplace that has as many as nine use cases, typical vendors only going to support really three or four particularly well. So it's really important for you to understand, you know, what are the key services that I want out of this platform. Early on, we're seeing kind of three of these really come to the fore. Um, marketing asset management, which obviously email is a subset of that. Certainly content as a service and micro experience syndication as well, um, which is not to uh, uh, reduce the value of the other ones. It's just that the OCP marketplace is a little bit slower towards realizing some of those other capabilities. So you definitely want to be thinking about this in terms of business services, but there's also some key capabilities that distinguish an OCP from some other sorts of technologies. So I'm just going to go through this list here and you know you can use it as kind of a, a Bible for yourselves, but first and foremost, an OCP needs to be object oriented. So this is a particular approach, it's a more complex approach. 
that supports compound asset management with parent-child sibling relationships and allows for highly extensible, ideally graph-based information modeling. This is a really huge differentiator, becomes really important in any kind of omni-channel environment where you are not just going to be reusing assets but potentially creating channel-specific derivatives. For example, very often an organization will take a video and, and, and use it one way on Facebook and a different way on their website and a different way on Twitter, um, uh, sometimes putting different bumpers or cutting it down to size. It's still the same core video, but they're creating derivatives of it and you want to keep track of those parent-child relationships. Of course, advanced asset and media management, but also text and HTML have to be first-class objects. Um, and I would argue also data itself as a first-class object. So you need tight integration with enterprise data services, and you need to be able to have where use tracking services. The other thing that's really important for an OCP that you don't always see in other content management systems is a connector framework. So you can deliver to other assembly services and other delivery environments rather than having that platform be the delivery environment itself, right? So these tend to be more headless systems and they need to have a connector framework. You want a richly shoppable store so that if I'm in an engagement tier, I can go back and shop the OCP to find just the assets that I need. This in turn means that you have to have very advanced permission models that you don't often see in kind of lower end content management and asset management systems. You have to support multiple taxonomies because of the breadth of the different channels here. And ideally, you have pluggable AI and ML services, so you're not necessarily limited to the vendor services. So these are key capabilities. And so this then is talking about kind of, you know, a little bit of a future. Um, but the, the question that we're really kind of posing in this webinar is, you know, how do you deal with this today? And so I think you definitely want to have that sort of future. Um, and so uh, uh, let's talk about what your options are. I'll remind you that if you have any questions at all, feel free to use the questions tab in your go to meeting, uh, uh, your go to webinar control panel, and we'll be sure to answer them. We'll have, definitely have time to answer them at the end. I already see some coming in. That's great. Feel free to either pose questions or if you have any comments or anything you disagree with. Okay. So what about today? So many of you already have digital asset management, web content management, content marketing platforms, product information management systems, CCM or component and XML content management systems. Those are the first five columns on this chart. Many of you already have these systems in place and many of the vendors in these marketplaces will say that they can support multi-channel or even omni-channel content management. And so the, the issue is really to what extent can they actually do this? So if we look at content support, which we have down the left uh, 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 column, and then some of the example content that you see on the right column, you start looking at this and you start seeing that, well, actually some of these systems don't really support the full spectrum of services and content types that you would need to be truly on the channel, that is on the channel base. So if we look, for example, in the first column on digital asset management, it's good for media asset management and image asset management, some compound asset management, but they're typically pretty bad at some of the other services that are really important in an omni-channel environment. Likewise, for the second column, web content and digital experience management can be pretty good at micro-narrative management, micro-experience management, uh, uh, if it's a highly structured system, some degree of document asset management, but pretty weak at some of the other ones. Same thing for content marketing platforms, which you see in the middle, product information management, component XML content management. These are very specialized systems. They don't give you the full breadth of what you need to be able to support heterogeneous uh, uh, content types and, and services in your different engagement channels. So an OCP is designed to sort of target each of these sorts of scenarios. Now, we gave it three quarters of a Harvey ball that doesn't mean that every OCP provides all these services. In fact, what our research does is sort of show you which ones are, are closer to this breadth of services than others. Um, but it gives you a sense of at least what is the target here and why has this marketplace emerged? And it's because of the insufficiency of the other platforms which are typically bound to a particular sort of engagement channel, a particular use case to serve as truly omni-channel environments. So this nascent marketplace has emerged. The key word here is nascent. 
Um, you have some complex platforms emerging from the DAM and WM, WCM space, SendShare, Nuxio, Sitecore style labs, historically digital asset management systems, Adobe, a little bit inconveniently having their omni-channel services striped across two different platforms, AEM sites and AEM uh, uh, assets, um, Oracle with its content hub. Um, and then you have very specialized products on the right, again, primarily out of the uh, uh, CMP or DAM or WCM space, content marketing platform, web content management, digital asset management. Acoustic is what was IBM's uh, content hub platform. And so, um, you know, you have you do have some choices, not as many as we might wish, wish for you, and still some emerging um, uh, services here, even though some of these vendors have been around for a while, they're more recently getting into the omni-channel game. So you want to sort of carefully test these sorts of platforms you know, before you deploy them. Let's wrap up here. It's really four key takeaways. One is you'll likely need some sort of OCP in the future if you're really serious about omni-channel content management, but the market remains somewhat immature in 2020. So we're not suggesting that you rush out necessarily today, although some of you have more urgent needs than others. So you want to meet your investment according to your urgency. If you, there are important use cases around email personalization, dynamic marketing materials and others, and if that's important to you, then you probably do want to investigate this market in 2020. Either way, don't default to your incumbent web content manager or DAM platform as a long-term OCP solution because many of them are, un, are, just suit, are gonna prove unsuitable for it, even if they're providing a little bit of multi-channel goodness today. And then finally, you want to look at OCP in the context of your broader stack. So I'm going to go full circle here and come back to another reference model with respect to your omni-channel stack. And so this is more of a services reference model where you still have that engagement tier at the top. And then you see in the red row below, omni-channel content management, where you're delivering core micro content and experience variety of services via content components. But... You have to have the intelligence to know where those content components are supposed to go and which ones fire when. And so you need some sort of orchestration and decisioning, ideally. Um, you're going to need to know who this customer is, what segment they might belong to. And so customer data management becomes important. Obviously, customer intelligence to feed into both of those and then operations hubs to manage these. So we know you can't do all of this at once. We're just suggesting that you consider all of these in the context of, of each other. And so no single one is going to completely get you to this fully customer-centric engagement model across all of your channels. Um, but as you explore each one, consider what you're going to be using to, 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 for, for some of the other services as well. Um, the good news is that uh, Real Story Group has vendor evaluations in all these segments, so you can definitely explore our site or talk to Scott for more information about that. Now... Of course, the person who's thinking about this stack, we call her Stacy, the stack owner. She gets a lot of questions bombarded at her every day. Um, and our mission in life is to sort of shield Stacy from all these questions by providing answers for her uh, through our research and advisory services so she can think about uh, what she uh, wants to have for lunch that day, including possibly a vegan cheeseburger. If you're interested in our omni-channel content platform research, you can download a free sample at realstorygroup.com slash try. Um, you'll learn the real weaknesses of the leading tools as well, of course, their strengths. Um, and uh, we also, of course, have tools uh, to, de to develop not a magic quadrant, but a real quadrant using your input so you can get to the right shortlist in just a matter of hours. Which brings me to Real Story Group's three subscription offerings. If you want to just get vendor selection advisory in any one of our individual streams like omni-channel content platforms. You can do that um, right online to inform and empower your tech selection teams with research and, and advice over the phone. Some of our larger subscribers uh, do an all-you-can-eat package through an omni-channel stack advisory where we advise stack owners like Stacy on strategic decisions and technology choices. And then a subset of those uh, have joined our exclusive customer-only uh, stack council leadership uh, for executive council, um, we're meeting again in a couple of weeks. Uh, that'll be our second meeting. We meet three times a year uh, to where peers can share experiences and learn lessons from each other in a in a uh, private confidential setting. So a number of questions have come in. While I go through those really quickly, Scott can talk to you about next steps. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. And uh, as Tony mentioned, we'd certainly encourage you at any time to, to download samples from not just the omnichannel uh, content platform research, but any of the other markets we cover. Yeah, you're welcome to take a look at that. And if you go to the tools page on our website, you can try out the Real Quadrant and real-time applications that Tony mentioned. And if it's something that you'd like to explore uh, in a little more depth, I'm happy to show you a behind the scenes tour of the Real Story Group subscriber experience. So reach out to us at explore at realstorygroup.com if that's something you'd like to schedule. In terms of uh, upcoming webinars, uh, we do have a couple more coming up on the calendar. So uh, next week at the same time, we'll be taking a more in-depth look at email and marketing automation technology options. So uh, you know, if you're looking at potentially evaluating new vendors or uh, validating your, your current vendor, certainly it could be worth taking a look at that uh, presentation next week. And then back to the omni-channel uh, technology theme, we'll be hosting a webinar uh, at the beginning of March, March 4th, on the right way to select technology for your new omni-channel stack. So certainly something to keep an eye out for um, if you'd like to learn more about these different topics. Uh, as Tony mentioned, there are some questions, and I'll let him address those. Tony? Sure, yeah, we've got quite a few questions, and there's still time if you want to add some more. Uh, so Randy's asking, is omni-channel content or marketing really accessible to smaller B2B companies, or is it really the domain of larger, more sophisticated B2C companies? So it definitely is the domain of B2B companies. In fact, I think um, in some ways it's, it's even more um, uh, important in a B2B environment, particularly if you're thinking about account-based marketing and other sorts of things, to really be thinking omni-channel. Um, the issue is for smaller companies is that you don't necessarily have the luxury or the ability or the capacity to build these kind of integrated stacks and so you may need to rely on single vendors to do this and we know that single vendors then you know can have blinders on with respect to particular channels so it is um, an, an issue certainly for smaller companies um, but but for larger uh, enterprises whether b2b or b2c i think this is really imperative um, so Jonathan is asking, do you really need an object-oriented DBMS? What about native XML DBMS? Are there popular DBMS, including open source, that are native OO or native XML today? So I think in terms of the repository, the key thing is that the repository is object-oriented, and the repository can be built on top of any number of different, you know, persistence layers, whether it's an XML database, um, a, a NoSQL database, um, some other structure, um, can even be built on top of a relational database, although that's tricky. Um, file system, there's any number of ways. The key thing is that the repository is object-oriented. We worry a little bit less about what's the actual data persistence layer underneath it. And it's not just that the repository needs to be object-oriented, it's the application itself needs to be able to be object-oriented. And one caveat I'll do is that this does introduce a degree of complexity. And the reason why some vendors don't go there is because it is complex. It's complex to model from a user interface. It creates more complexity for the users themselves. Um, sometimes it's much easier for them to just have a more sort of relational information model where attributes are, uh, are ex where extensions are just different attributes on a some base element. Um, but we find that that doesn't really scale quite right for the omni-channel world. Ken is asking a good question. We are working with CPGs in retail and finding a theme around story management i.e. successful CPGs are building stories around their product, like provenance. Ken, that's a really great point. And I think that um, one of the ways that we describe omni-channel content platforms is that that's where you have your story. That's where you base your story. What is our story around something? And so then, and that story can be around a particular campaign, it can be around a particular product um, or any other kind of initiative. There's a core story there. How that story gets told is gonna differ in different channels, as well it should, because you're gonna to talk to people a little bit differently in Twitter um, than on your website, than in Facebook, than via Alexa. Uh, but you still wanna keep that same kind of story coherence. Um, and so, and you also, as you mentioned, wanna track the provenance of all those assets back to the core assets, right? So that's, this is what I was talking about earlier around being able to make sure that your derivatives are tied to, to the core content. So um, uh, definitely love that idea of, of of being able to manage stories at an enterprise level, and then how you tell those stories uh, depends on particular channels. 
Great. So um, that, uh, oh wait, I've got one last question here. Um, question around where is Microsoft and SAP and Salesforce? Right, so they were not on the map. Uh, Microsoft has never been really interested in component content management. And for that matter, has a very narrow MarTech story, primarily around their CRM uh, platform um, and dynamics and some things that are dynamics offshoots, including an email uh, service provider and now a, um, a, uh, a kind of a mini CDP as well. But this is definitely not in Microsoft's wheelhouse and it's not clear that it ever will be. SAP is interesting because, you know, from a content management perspective, they've been largely AWOL and, you know, there's some various things that are spread around some of their e-commerce platforms and others that, that get into catalog management, but there's definitely not an OCP story there. Salesforce is interesting because they're promoting their new content management system as an OCP, but it really isn't yet. It's primarily for pushing content into different pages around its ecosystem, mostly around the community platform. Um, and so that may grow into kind of an OCP, but it would be very limited because it's really around pushing to Salesforce. And our vision around this, and I think I would advise you, your vision is that a vendor is not going to give you an omni-channel platform. You're going to have engagement silos from any number of different vendors. So when Salesforce says, here's your core content platform, what they're really saying is here's a core content platform that may be able to deliver content to some Salesforce engagement platforms, not to all of your engagement platforms. And so this is why you have to be really careful about some of the big MarTech vendors telling you that they can do omnichannel when really they can't. You need to have independent enterprise-wide layers underneath all of those vendors. All right, so that's my soapbox for the day. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, certainly echo uh, Scott's notion that if you're interested in some of these topics and, and related fields, we've got other webinars coming up. In the meantime, do check out our research. And so for Scott Dill, this is Tony Byrne signing off. Thanks.